On behalf of Boulder Community Health, it is my pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, Dr. Daniel O'Hare. Dr. O'Hare is one of the nation's leading experts in robotic-assisted mitral valve repair and Colorado's most experienced surgeon with this procedure performed with the Da Vinci surgical system. Dr. O'Hare also has been selected as a global proctor for transcatheter aortic valve replacement, or TAVR, meaning he teaches other cardio <clears throat> excuse me, he teaches other cardiologists to perform this innovative procedure. Prior to joining Boulder Community Health, Dr. O'Hare successfully created one of the largest high-performing heart valve programs in the United States and was active in clinical trials. He served as a medical community leader in Wisconsin for two decades, performing the first robotic-assisted mitral valve repair, TAVR, <clears throat> and mitral valve replacement procedures in the state. Dr. O'Hare received his medical degree from Medical College of Wisconsin, where he also completed his residency and a research fellowship in general surgery. He went on to complete an additional fellowship in transplantation, as well as residency in cardiac surgery at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. He sees patients at Boulder Heart at Foothills Hospital. So please help me welcome Dr. O'Hare. Great, thank you, Wendy. Uh, I, I did want to start by saying thank you uh, uh, to Wendy, who's been so great in helping set this up, Amy, Aaron Foley, so many others who helped uh, put this together. Uh, I've had a lot of help, so uh, thank you to every, all the support. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about treatments for aortic valve disease and specifically about aortic valve prostheses or devices that are used to replace the aortic valve. Over the last 20 some years, I've had the opportunity to work with thousands of these devices, uh, implanting them in thousands of patients. And it's really become my passion. Uh, as as uh, Wendy mentioned, I, my training is you know, in everything from pacemakers to heart transplant, but my focus in my career is really heart valve therapy. So I, tonight we're gonna spend a few minutes and it's gonna be kind of like, uh, you know, the show Inside Baseball, where they tell you what's going on from the locker room or the bench. I, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we talk about when we talk about heart valves in planning and treating patients and, and try to focus on some things that I think folks need to know or should know, uh, especially if they're looking at some kind of uh, treatment uh, in the future. Uh, the talk is going to be, it's a little bit scientific. Um, so I'm gonna present some scientific data. I, I never underestimate the intelligence of my, of my audience, so I think uh, I'll, I will try to make it as clear as possible, but I know there's some really bright people uh, in the audience, and, and, um, uh, and we're gonna talk also a little bit uh, about history. Um, what we're not gonna do is talk too much about brands. This is not an ad for any device or um, you know, for or against any particular device but really focused on really um, what, what the patients should, should know, you know, if you're really informed. And, you know, I, I suppose if, if you were uh, in my office and we were chatting about uh, heart valve replacement and aortic valve replacement, you know, we would talk about things like open surgery and transcatheter valves. And we'd talk, and you would probably ask me some questions like, at least this is what I have been hearing, he's like, well, you know, how, how well does this thing work? I mean, is it gonna relieve my symptoms? How well is it gonna relieve my symptoms? How long is it gonna last? Uh, am I gonna need this again someday? So these are some of the questions that we're gonna uh, dive into tonight in the next few minutes, and then hopefully um, in our conversation after the, the presentation. I, I'm gonna talk a little bit about design and quality. Uh, design for the engineers in the audience, you know, is everything. Um, and quality is something we're focused on uh, continuously in, in medicine and healthcare. So we'll talk a little bit about those things. We'll talk about um, durability uh, and performance. Durability, how long is my valve gonna last? Performance, how well is it gonna work for me? Uh, and then a couple of other uh, things, structural valve deterioration, which is really the, the, the term we use to describe how these valves fail. Uh, when, they're when they wear out, 
Um, how does that happen? And what does it look like? And, and what are the implications if the patient is developing some of this? Structural valve deterioration is, and we'll get into some definitions in a little bit, but it's a spectrum. It's not like these valves are working great one day and the next day it's failed. It, it, in general, in general, it's, it's more of a, a slower degradation. And we'll talk a little bit about how that's detected, how it's measured, and, uh, and how these valves perform. Uh, and we'll just touch briefly on, you know, what is a lifetime? Most people will say, hey, I'd love to just get this once in my life, right? I don't want multiple operations, multiple valves, multiple catheterizations, <coughs> excuse me. And, and so how can we uh, put that into some perspective? So let's start a little bit uh, with design and quality. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm always inspired by Edwards Deming, who is a PhD. Actually, he, I think he did his undergraduate here in Boulder, if I'm not mistaken, did some of his grad school, I believe in Wyoming. But he, uh, uh, Dr. Deming is really uh, considered sort of the father of, of quality assurance. And he's published hundreds of articles uh, related to topics including statistical variance, systems, and systems thinking. Um, he's, he's really the, the grandfather, or probably at this point, of continuous quality improvement, a system that we use uh, in healthcare to, com to continuously uh, uh, reiterate and redesign uh, in, a, in an effort to, to get better uh, quality and better results every time. And that's true in, in all fields of, of medicine. It's especially true in, uh, in heart care and heart valve uh, treatment. But what I, what I really love about Dr. Deming is this statement that uh, his quote, that every system is perfectly designed to give the result that it does. <clears throat> and I think it's a clever way, kind of tongue in cheek, of saying design is everything. And with the proper design, anything is possible, right? We see people landing rockets vertically these days. I mean, things that you never would have imagined. Now we're delivering heart valves uh, through a blood vessel. And uh, so, so these systems are, can, are obviously quite complex, but the design is absolutely uh, essential uh, to the outcome. This slide shows um, some heart valves, and these are traditionally surgically implanted heart valves through the incision on the front of the chest, um, large or small. These are the, the valves that have been developed, designed, and implanted uh, over the many years, 60, 70 years now. On the left, in the purple box, these are, these are quite old, uh, but original designs. Uh, in the top, in the middle there, that's called the Star Edwards valve. That was really the first heart valve uh, designed and implanted successfully in a human being. That's, it's kind of like a ball in a cage. And when the heart would squeeze, the ball would rise up in the cage, the blood would go around it into the patient's uh, aorta. And then when the heart relaxed, the ball would fall down and seal like a normally functioning valve, which was a great design. They were, they were extremely durable, uh, this design. Um, to a certain extent. For example, there's, there's, there's a case report of one that was explanted after 49 years. So that's, that's really impressive. The problem is that it, when it failed, sometimes the, the cage would fail and the ball would shoot out like a cannon into the patient's uh, blood vessel and you can imagine that that doesn't end well. So again, design is really key. And on the right side, you'll see some more uh, contemporary valve designs. These are um, made from uh, a metal frame uh, covered in Dacron, and then leaflets made from either a pig or a cow. Those are very common um, components used to create a heart valve. And each one of these um, is, uh, these are still being implanted. Many of these are still being implanted in the United States today and very common on the upper left. That's a, uh, in the white box is a bovine pericardial valve. That valve is designed using the pericardium or sac around a cow's heart to create the leaflets and, and a functioning valve. It's the most uh, commonly implanted valve in the United States today. It, it works great, it's a, it's a tremendous design, but it has to be implanted through an incision, uh, generally on the front of the chest, and, uh, um, uh, but it's certainly been a workhorse. And each of these valves is a, has a slightly different design, and because of that, their performance is slightly different and their durability is slightly different. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about, about valves, and this, this kind of just gives you an array uh, uh, of um, ideas about what surgically implanted valves look like. And I would add parenthetically, when we talk about these to patients, we generally say, 
these are good for about 10 to 15 years. There's some variation in, uh, with that, but in general, 10 to 15 years is what many people will quote for durability of these valves. They are the gold standard. We've been studying these for, again, more than 50 years. And everything that's sort of come uh, more recently has been compared against those, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> This slide shows uh, really the much more contemporary uh, devices which are able to be delivered uh, into the aortic position uh, using a wire and a catheter through the leg. So avoiding the, 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 the cut breastbone, uh, these devices can be collapsed, uh, put on a wire, delivered into the heart, and then re-expanded. And they, they work by a variety of different methods. On the top uh, row, you'll see these are commercially available valves. Uh, in the bottom row, these are some of the valves that are available around the world. Some of these are still, in, are still being tested uh, through clinical trials. But the, the, the overwhelming majority of valves that are implanted today, transcatheter valves, uh, are the two in the top right. That's the uh, Evolute and Sapien platforms. They're, they're very different. Uh, in design, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that. The, but the Evolute valve, that's top on the top row, second from the right, that's a self-expanding device. And I'll show you another picture of it, but it is, it's a, made of nitinol, which is a unique uh, blend of uh, nickel and titanium, which you can crush down when it's cold, it'll stay crushed, and when it warms up, it springs back to its original shape. Uh, the, the other valve the, the, on the far right is a, um, is, is more rigid, it's, a, it's a, um, a chromium frame with bovine pericardial leaflets, and uh, that's delivered also through the leg and expanded by a balloon. So we'll talk about these two because those are the ones that are largely in use today. Some of these others are still being used, but statistically, if you're gonna have a, one of these valves implanted tomorrow, most likely it's gonna be one of those, one of those two valves. So you know, we've, I've shown you pictures now of probably, I don't know what, 30 valves or something. You know, how do you make sense of all this? And, uh, you know, what, what, are the, what are the things that you need to know and understand to make uh, good decisions around uh, valve selection, which is something that should be done jointly between the, the physician, the surgeon, cardiologist, and the patient. Uh, because the patients are very interested in how long will my valve last. Uh, you know, again, we talked about the fact that um, most people want a once-in-a-lifetime solution, and that's what we try to give them. Uh, and then, you know, as you're thinking about all this huge array of valves, you know, what is the, what is the standard against which they should be compared? And as it turns out, the, the standard is what we've understood for the last 50 years are the surgical implants. They've been known, studied, um, implanted, explanted, uh, and so that has really uh, been the gold standard as these new things uh, uh, come onto the market and become available. Uh, as we talk about the data a little bit, and, and to, to the best of our ability, we like to make data-driven decisions in our practice. We don't, you know, emotional decisions generally are not, uh, may, may or may not be well supported, but data-driven decisions are really uh, sort of fundamental to good science and good medicine. I, what I want to talk about uh, is a couple, give a couple of definitions because you're going to hear me mention these today. And again, um, there's no blood on any of these slides or guts or anything like that, but there are some cartoons, uh, pictures of the heart, like this one. And this is, I want to describe for you something called the aortic annulus, right? So this is a key concept in, in heart valve therapy, uh, especially as it pertains to the aortic valve. And as you can see in the picture here on, on the right is, is the heart, sort of a cut sectional view, the aortic valve with those three leaflets in the middle there. And that, those three leaflets are attached to the wall right at the connection of the left ventricle and the aorta. So that, that's a key place you need a valve. That's where the aortic valve lives. And there's, there's sort of a semi-rigid uh, ring there, sort of a fibrous ring where the leaflets are attached. That's called the aortic annulus. That is, a f generally speaking, a fixed structure. And so when the heart is um, uh, beats, squeezes, it's got to push the blood through the annulus and the valve. And, and the reason that's important is if you've got a small annulus, uh, you know, it, it could be flow limiting under some conditions. And if you have a large annulus, you could put in a larger valve and have better flow dynamics. So we'll talk a little bit about the aortic annulus. And then the other thing I wanted to just talk about, you're going to hear me say a few times, is again, structural valve deterioration, which again uh, is how, how valves 
generally fail. Uh, and, and structural valve deterioration, we use the abbreviation SVD here a few times, but these are changes that occur to the valve, such as calcification or fibrosis or a tear that happens while the valve is in the patient, generally over time and after hopefully an extended period of time. But when they do wear out, um, structural valve deterioration is the term we use to talk about decay and, and uh, loss of, of function. So let's look a little bit at, at these uh, two valves that are most commonly implanted. This is the, the balloon expandable uh, platform. It's got a rigid frame. Uh, it's, it is expanded, as I mentioned, by a balloon when it's put in position. And this valve lives in the annulus. So it's inside that ring, uh, the valve and the leaflets and the frame and this, and this little cuff on the bottom are all uh, inside the annulus. And they do take up a little bit of room, so they make it a little bit smaller. But this valve was designed after that, that the most commonly implanted surgical valve I showed you, made by the uh, same company with, with, um, with an excellent history with these bovine pericardial leaflets, which have worked so well in the past. So it was really de designed after that surgical valve to try to get the same great result. The other valve that's commonly implanted, you'll see on the right side of the screen here, um, and that valve is a little bit different in design. This is really the first valve that was designed from the ground up to be delivered over a wire through your leg. And it has this nitinol frame, which is collapsible and self-expanding. But the valve, the leaflets of the valve, instead of being in the annulus, which is where you kind of see the bottom of the, this valve, they're up above these, this sort of butterfly-shaped uh, figure. Those are the leaflets. And they're different than the other leaflets. They're taller. They're canted backward. And they're, in, and importantly, above the annulus. So that's a, that's a different design. And these two valves have been studied extensively. In fact, there are no, uh, there are no other valves in the world that have been ex studied as extensively as these two valves. And I'm going to show you a, a bunch of data that's unique to these um, two systems, if you will. And the first thing is, uh, if you look at the way these valves handle mechanical stress, uh, this is something called finite element analysis. And you can see that the, the superannular valve on the left, that kind of looks like the big tall frame, and then the shorter frame uh, um, balloon expandable valve on the right. And when you look at um, the, the mechanical stress on these leaflets, as it turns out, there's about 30% less stress on the leaflets uh, of the self-expanding superannular valve. And that is, uh, and you can see, on, it's shown graphically on the right there. A um, couple different versions of each of these valves are slightly, slightly different. But in each case, the, the self-expanding superannular valve demonstrates less stress measured by uh, megapascals on the, on the y-axis. And so in the, on the far right, this is what the surgical valves generally look like. So what we're seeing is at least there's some tabletop uh, uh, evidence that, the, that maybe the stresses on these valves are different, and perhaps the stress on the on, perhaps this has some meaning when you implant the um, valve into a patient may uh, may affect durability perhaps. <clears throat> so as I mentioned earlier, these these two valves have been studied like no others through randomized clinical trials where patients were. Uh, hundreds and, some, and essentially thousands of patients have been randomized to either open surgery in a surgical valve or a transcatheter valve done through your leg. These studies are, are done, uh, you know, through through uh, the 2010s, um, and and some of that data is still still maturing. So when you look at, let's just look at the balloon expandable device first. And if you and now these graphs are hard to read, so I'm going to kind of talk you through them. It's a super busy slide. But what I'll point out to you, and the next time I'll blow this up bigger, but if you look at the bar graphs to the right, these show uh, structural valve deterioration. In, the, in direct comparison, the group of patients who had their valve uh, replaced surgically with an open operation, a sternotomy, those folks are in the red. And the, the people who had their valve replaced through the leg with this bovine pericardial balloon expandable valve are in the blue. And what this shows is that within five years, the rate 
of degeneration of the transcatheter valve is significantly higher than the surgical valve. So, there, so the attempt to make a valve delivered through the leg that's just as durable as the one um, done open um, was, not, was not borne out by this data. Uh, subsequently, there have been a few changes to the valve. There is some data that suggests now that this, that this valve is equivalent, roughly equivalent, to surgical implants in terms of its durability. But what about the other valve? What about the one, the taller one with the big leaflets, with less stress on it? What are, how does that perform uh, in, in randomized trials against surgical implants? I remember we said the surgical implant was, has been the gold standard. It looks like the, the one we looked at just now, initially not performing as well, maybe, maybe equivalent now. Well, let's look at this self-expanding platform. And I, I just want to share with you, this is an article I was pleased uh, to be the lead author on with a number of cardiologists and surgeons from around the country and one or two from Europe, where we looked at together, we looked at structural valve deterioration or how do these, how do the self-expanding uh, supraannular valve, how does that compare to surgery or surgical implants in terms of structural valve deterioration or, or, uh, or valve uh, failure? And what we found, and nobody can read this, I can't even read this, but what the studies were, these are huge randomized control trials done at the best centers around the world. And there were, in the randomized part, in, uh, I'll just share with you, there are about 2,000 patients randomized in this study. There's another 2,400 or so that we also looked at to determine things like risk factors. But the randomized data is based on, on 2,000 patients randomized to either supraannular self-expanding valve or a surgical implant. And, and what was found here is, was rather unique. And again, I'll, these are hard to see, but on the top, you can see this is uh, over time, sorry, x-axis is over time, out to five years, y-axis is effective orifice area. How big is the opening for that valve? And when, it, when it's fully open, is it open just a little or is it a big wide opening? And what we found is that at every single time point measured over five years, this self-expanding supraannular TAVR valve had a larger opening than the surgical implants uh, in, in, in randomized patients. And on the bottom, you'll see uh, something we, we uh, measure called the gradient. And, and the gradient is, is a pressure difference across these valves, which is important to us because in order to get the best flow to your brain, muscles, and organs, uh, your heart's got to it's got to get do some work, and the higher the pressure gradient across this valve, the more work your heart has to do. So lower gradients are much better. The natural gradient across your valve uh, and mine, hopefully, is uh, you know sort of in uh, three to five millimeters of mercury. These valves uh, are, can achieve cl very close to that, but again, it was um, the statistically better, uh, and I think clinically better um, with this. Uh, self-expanding valve when compared to, to surgery. What about durability? Well, here's, the, here's uh, the next thing we found, which I think was even more interesting. And that is, if you look at the graph on the upper left-hand corner, you'll see on the, um, the y-axis is uh, the incidence of structural valve deterioration or valve failure. Remember, that doesn't mean it's Catastrophic failure means beginning to show signs of. And in the yellow uh, is the, are the patients who received surgical implant. And in the blue, I think it's blue on this uh, slide, uh, those are the patients who had the transcatheter valve. And this was, uh, interestingly, the, the rate of valve deterioration was significantly less among the, the transcatheter version superannular valve than the surgery. So now the difference is here we're seeing this transcatheter valve outperforming the surgical implants. And if, if you look at the top right in patients who are, these are small annulus patients. They're generally small patients, uh, um, by and large, uh, older, smaller women or small framed individuals. And in smaller people, this uh, difference was even more dramatic 
uh, there was about four times uh, the rate of structural valve deterioration in the surgical implants than among the transcatheter ones. So that was, that was dramatic. When you lump, uh, and when you look just at the, the largest valves, uh, that's the lower left there, and the same trend. Uh, not quite statistically significant, but clearly uh, uh, numerically different, uh, favoring the transcatheter valve. The last uh, chart in the lower right here just really refers to how these valves, when they do fail, what is the mechanism, and it's generally by re-narrowing. Um, so that was really the first time any valve has been really shown, transcatheter valve particularly, has been shown to be superior to surgical, uh, the, the surgical implants in a randomized uh, control trial with uh, literally thousands of patients. A couple of the other things that we learned from this were, so what are some of the things that are predictors of, of the valve degenerating? Um, we know that uh, female gender, I think it's mostly a size thing. We saw some data on sizing is, uh, puts people at a little more risk for valve uh, degeneration. And there were a couple other things that, became, that, were, that were statistically significant. Of course, age, if you're young, you're more likely to wear your valve out than, than older folks. And then these other things that are on here about previous uh, coronary intervention or hypertension or atrial fibrillation. There may be something there, but this study was not powered to determine why, that, why those things may be um, predictive. And then, you know, so some people say, well, so the valve's wearing out a little bit. You know, again, I mentioned structural valve deterioration is a spectrum. You know, it starts, gets a little narrow, a little more narrow, a little more narrow, and then, you know, it can be a serious problem. So, the, so we detect this by echocardiography. We follow it over time. But what if, you, what if you have this? Like, what if you've got some of it? You have structural valve deterioration, not the kind where it's, the valve's completely shot, but it's starting to, starting to decay. So what does that, what does that mean? Well, what we found is that patients had, who had structural valve deterioration uh, had a higher uh, all-cause mortality, they had a higher cardiovascular mortality, and they had a higher rate of rehospitalization for heart failure. So this has real um, clinical implications, and uh, we looked at the data every possible way you could. It was very clear structural valve deterioration was associated with poor outcomes. So, so you, you want to have a device that's going to help you uh, avoid that uh, as a problem. Uh, and then, you know, the, so the key takeaway really from this, from this uh, study was that for the first time, you know, a valve has been uh, designed, developed, and implanted that has a lower incidence of structural valve deterioration than, than, uh, surgical, than the surgical implant group. And this, this difference was magnified in patients who were smaller, with a small annulus. And as I mentioned, if you get structural valve deterioration, it's associated with increased mortality, cardiovascular mortality, and heart failure admission. Um, and as we just covered, younger age and female gender um, were predicted a higher rate of structural valve deterioration. So, you know, the, in, in conclusion, you know, the, it, really does, um, it really does matter which valve you have. Um, and since we don't know how long a lifetime is, um, you really should implant the best valve first, the most durable, the most high-performing valve. And since there are some on the market, uh, it's, it's, it, it's beneficial for the patients to understand the differences in some of these uh, designs. They're, they're, um, these studies will help uh, inform the development of newer and better valves, but right now uh, these are some of the highest performing valves available uh, in the world. And uh, at, at Boulder Heart and Boulder Community Health, we are constantly focused on this like a laser. Our experience, our research, our writing, uh, helps keep our patients uh, on the cutting edge of, of heart care. And um, so I'm, I'm grateful that, that folks could tune in tonight and hear, hear my uh, thoughts and opinions on heart valve therapy for the aortic position. And uh, I'd be happy to uh, take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. O'Hare. That was very, uh, very interesting and informing, uh, informative. And we would like to ask um, our guests to go ahead and type some questions into the <clears throat> into the chat box area below the screen, and we'll get to those. So um, while 
we're waiting for some more to come in. We have a couple of questions. Um, so what is done in terms of recovery and how much time does it take to recover from a valve replacement procedure? And does it vary between the different options of valves that you yes. discussed? Well, it certainly does. There's certainly, um, and that's a great question, and I think it's something that's front and center in the minds of most or all patients. You know, how long is the, my recovery? We didn't cover that. So, so thanks for asking. No, there's no question um, when the valve, you know, if we're doing open heart surgery to, uh, with an incision on the front of the chest, the hospital stay is somewhere between uh, five and seven days typically. Um, and so, uh, and there's, you know, and, and there's, there's bone that's got to heal and that takes, you know, six or eight weeks. So that is a, that's a longer recovery, there's no question. Uh, the transcatheter uh, device, usually folks are home within 48 hours some the next day. There are some precautions around the blood vessels and such that were used for access, but by and large, those folks are sort of up and at them, you know, within a week. Perfect. Um, can the same level of activity occur after the replacement? And does it vary from device to device? Right, well, so, a couple things on that. <clears throat> One of the challenges is uh, is in patients that are in small patients, right? So we talked a little bit about if your valve is, your native valve, your own valve is small, there are some particular challenges around that. And when you, there are comparisons uh, head to head of these valves, uh, particularly in small patients, um, uh, there's, there's a lower a gradient and larger opening with the self-expanding valve. Um, in, in larger sizes, they generally perform uh, similarly uh, in terms of flow uh, dynamics. Um, but uh, there are special circumstances where really, um, you know, for example, if, you've, if a patient has had, so again, it's all about keeping the largest uh, orifice, um, and it appears at least uh, certainly in the smaller sizes and, uh, and, in, and in many conditions that that one valve has a better uh, performance in terms of flow, faster recovery, um, uh, in terms of uh, you know getting back to the to your um, previous sports and things like that. Excellent. <clears throat> this guest has two questions. The first one is, can Taver be used when patients have aneurysms in the aorta? Uh, the Short answer is yes. Um, you know, always there's there's something in the details, but no, it's certainly possible, and we've done many times patients with uh, small aneurysms that there's no plan to fix. Uh, people can, you know, again, aneurysmal disease also occurs on a spectrum, small, medium, large, right? And um, but there are patients, and we've certainly treated them in the in the clinical trials. Uh, I can remember several people with with quite large aneurysms who were too sick to ever get them fixed, and those patients can be successfully treated. Um, but aneurysmal disease, you know, has to be monitored as well. And uh, so the short answer is yes, it can, and there are circumstances where it is appropriate. Um, and if someone's had an aneurysm repaired previously, we can work through that repaired aneurysm and, and put the valve in as well, so. Is TAVR being used for patients uh, under 80 or around 80 years old? Right, another great question. Uh, if you saw in the data, most of these folks are older. So there's been a series of studies over the last decade uh, where the risk level has come down. Initially, uh, when I first started doing this in 2010, we were, these clinical trials were just to make sure this thing was safe and that uh, it could be done um, you know, without excessive mortality. And so those, we were able to put the devices in, in patients who were called extreme risk. I mean, they were so high risk that, that they could not possibly have surgery. Many of those patients were over the age of 80. Um, so that's kind of where things started. And then as, as the devices got better, the practice got better, people got more experience, these studies started to move down in age and risk so that intermediate, you know, those are sort of 
extreme risk patients, then there were high risk patients, then intermediate risk patients. These terms probably mean more to me having read the protocols, but you get the idea. The risk level is coming down and, and recently uh, it's been shown to be safe and effective in low risk patients. Now, who are those people? In general, there's very little data on how these valves perform in patients under the age of 65. There will be, there will be some data forthcoming. Um, but, but right now, um, the guidelines, you know, American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology guidelines say that it, can, it should be considered for people over the age of 65. Um, some um, folks will think that's too liberal. Um, and, uh, but in, in fact, we've also implanted uh, patients much younger. I think the uh, youngest person I implanted was 47, if I remember correctly. But there were reasons why that per person couldn't have open heart surgery. So every case is a little bit special. Um, but certainly, yes, there are many people being implanted in their 70s. That's happening commonly. Perfect. Are there equivalent valves for the non-aortic valves? Position, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, another great question. The, so there are similar valves. Uh, many of them are still in development. Um, the... the uh, so there are devices that, some of these can be used in special circumstances uh, to treat other valves, but there are in development right now a number of valves for the mitral position with similar technology, self-expanding or balloon expanded, also for the tricuspid position. So, and there is a, and we've implanted uh, in the a pulmonic valve as well. So yes, the answer is there are, there is technology for uh, all four valves. Uh, some of it is still in development and still in clinical trials, so not widely available um, outside of an you know, uh, experimental clinical trial. How long do you monitor patients post-TAVR? Explain what this monitoring includes. Sure. After any valve replacement, whether it's done with uh, TAVR or surgical, uh, patients need to be monitored, uh, and that's done by echocardiography. So any patient who's had this procedure has had echo prior, they'll have echoes uh, afterward. A little bit depends on your cardiologist and you know, your particular circumstances, but certainly uh, every two years at a minimum early on. Some people like to study the patients every year just to keep an eye on it. And, um, and, and so somewhere between annually and every couple of years uh, for, for a lifetime, really. Is uh, TAVR appropriate for someone who has prior matri uh, mitral valve repair? Uh, TAVR for prior mitral valve repair. Uh, well, it, it, it has been done. We've, I've done some of that. Uh, those, there's a group we have nationally that puts their data together. The results are not great, and so it's really reserved for extreme circumstances where there's no other solution. It's a, it is a riskier prospect. Uh, what I will say, though, is that if you've had a prior um, mitral valve replacement with a biological valve, um, there is good solution. We use that uh, balloon expandable valve, and, and, and it can go inside the old frame. So that, that's something that is happening that is uh, with per in persons with failed uh, previous mitral valve um, surgery, mitral valve replacement. There are other things, too. If you, I think the question was specifically about repair. And there are, other, there are other things that can be done uh, for a failed mitral valve repair, which include, uh, there's a clip device called MitraClip uh, that we, we use a lot here uh, for the right patients. It's a great solution. Uh, so that's another option. What are infection rates for the two types of implantation? They're very low. These are about 1%. Uh, it, it's, it's quite low. And it, again, it depends on, on what population of folks you're looking at, um, but uh, no, they're, they're, they're quite low. Uh, can our body reject a valve as a foreign object? Right, so these, the tissue that's used for the, for the creation of these valves has been washed uh, in a manner that removes the antigens. Antigens are what stimulate the immune response. So the, so the body does not reject the valve, it does not uh, it doesn't require you taking immune suppressive medications or 
or anything like that. Uh, it doesn't mean they can't suffer from wear and tear and calcification and fibrosis and things like that, but rejection is not, uh, not a major contributor. Does having a bicuspid aortic valve change <clears throat> eligibility for TAVR? Right. Uh, so it can in some situations, uh, but uh, patients with bicuspid valve can be safely treated with TAVR under, in many conditions. Again, you know, a lot of these things are specific to the patient, the exact measurements uh, of the valve, the, the apparatus above the valve, the, the sinuses of Valsalva, the coronary height. There's a lot of things that get measured. But, I'll, but in general, uh, a, a bicuspid valve is not an exclusion uh, for TAVR. Um, bicuspid valve, they have some features that can that could potentially exclude a patient. Uh, size is one of them, I think fixed at once. Is there a best type of valve for a person who wants to be able to do very intense level? Performance for a physically active person is the valve that's gonna have the lowest gradient and the valve that's gonna have the largest opening or effective orifice area. Uh, in my opinion, that's the self-expanding supraannular valve. Uh, is this device appropriate for only aortic valve stenosis or for all aortic valve disease? It has been used that way, but it, that's um, an unapproved uh, indication. Can you tell us about insurance and how its coverage occurs, especially given the fact that the longevity of the device or devices is about 10 years? Yeah. I, I, <laughs> That's, uh, I have no idea about anything about the insurance. Fortunately, these days, they keep the doctors away from all of that stuff. But I think what the, what the question gets at an important point, which is value, right? These, these are not cheap. None of this stuff is, is cheap. It's, it, there's, a, there's a substantial expense associated with, with these valves. And so if you're going to get one, the greatest value to the patient, again, you know, value being you know, the best quality at the lowest cost, uh, the best value is going to be delivered by the, the most durable valve and the valve that has the best you know, flow dynamics. So there is, there is something to that. That's, um, I think it's important, something I think about uh, when you think about our health system, our hospital, uh, how, to, how to deliver uh, the best care uh, at the best cost, uh, you know, therefore delivering the best value to the patient. I think it's, it's something to, to consider, but I don't, I don't, I'm not an expert on uh, the ins and outs of insurance for this. They, they keep me away from that, fortunately. Is an anti, uh, anticoagulant therapy needed after implanting the TAVR valve? Uh, what about anti-rejection drugs? Right, so anti-rejection, we covered that a minute ago, not needed. Um, again, uh, some, uh, in general, uh, patients are, are given an, an antiplatelet drug uh, for three months. There may be reasons why that's adjusted up or down, but that's sort of a general principle. Uh, there are some patients who come who are on anticoagulants for other reasons. We just we leave them on those. Um, and there are situations where the patients have bleeding complications where those antiplatelet drugs can be safely stopped and the valve will continue to work. But in general, uh, three months of, of anticoagulation is is the most common. Perfect. All right then. All righty, we do have a couple more questions coming in. That's great. Uh, viewers, go ahead and ask away. Um, what percentage of TAVR patients need re, a reoperation in the weeks and months following this procedure? Yeah, it's very uncommon. So <clears throat> this this procedure, the TAVR procedure, uh, much like when we do robotic mitral valve repair, these minimally invasive approaches, part of the conversation is, you know, you, you could need an operation if something goes uh, awry, um, you know, you could need to be rescued or by a bigger incision and whatever needs to be done to get the patient um, home safely. Uh, however, these are extremely rare Phenomenon. I can't remember. Again, I've done a couple thousand of these tavers. I think we've maybe opened two people that I can recall off the top of my head. I mean, it's just really uncommon. Um, but not. It's not. It's not a zero 
it's not a zero phenomenon. And the same with robotic mitral repair, very uncommon to have to open, but if, you know, for patient safety, uh, it's always on the table. This is a similar question. What percentage of patients expire during the operation or within six months to a year following TAVER? Well, so that, that is um, uh, really, de the answer to that really depends on what populations you're looking at, right? So if you are, um, so let's just say, there's a couple ways to answer that. If you're, it depends on your patient mix, right? So for example, remember I talked about early on, we did a lot of extreme risk people. They've had open heart surgery a couple times. Or folks, here's a good example, on dialysis, right? Someone's on dialysis, they've got bad aortic stenosis. Uh, we treat them, that, that's a 5% 30-day mortality. And the one-year mortality is, you know, 25% to 30%. And, um, but you have to understand that in the context of the patients aren't dying from their valve implant or their valve disease, they're dying from other causes. So does mortality happen? Absolutely. Um, but mortality related to, to during the procedure, again, extraordinarily uncommon. How can the patient determine if the proposed surgeon is truly qualified to do this procedure? <laughs> uh, you gotta do, I guess do your homework, ask around, meet them, ask them for, for their experience. I, you know, that's a, you know, fortunately I, I'll say that, um, the, you know, the training is good, the devices are excellent now, and so it's not nearly as difficult as it once was. Uh, and these programs are, 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 are widely available, you know, and, yeah, that's a that's a that's a that's an old question. You know, how do you find a good doctor? And often it's word of mouth and reputation and things like that. Um, so yeah, that's it's a challenge. Uh, ask a lot of questions. You know, if some people have published their results. Uh, you know, for example, this is you know this paper that we showed. You know, I mean, we probably put hundreds of patients into that, it's 2,000 patients, I'm sure, I don't know how many of them are mine, but I'm probably a couple hundred or something. So, you know, look, you know, the experience of your implanter may be documented somewhere. All righty. Uh, what is the age limit for the transcatheter procedure? You well, there's no just... real age limit. I mean, the oldest patient I did was 100. Um, <laughs> And my, one of my favorites, I don't have favorites, but one of my favorites is a, a woman I did in Wisconsin. She early on, she was 99 and a half, lived independently. I like to tell the story. She's, she was 99 and a half, lived by herself. Her, her um, um, nephew used to come by every day and check on her. And then one night she went into heart failure and couldn't breathe, called her, called her nephew and she said, what are they going to do with me at the hospital? I'm 99 years old. And uh, she came in. We saw her, treated her, put one of these valves in her. She lived uh, in her own home to be 103 and a half. And, um, and she's a lovely lady. We used to visit her in her house, and she'd make pie and stuff. And the reason she ultimately succumbed is she was baking, and she was up on a stool and reaching for something and had a fall, broke her hip. And then at that age, you know, it's 103 and a half. It's tough to come back from a hip. Fracture, but so there's really no upper limit on the number. It's really about how the how the patient uh, functions, and of course, this lady was a very high functioning 99 year old woman. So, wow, absolutely good for her. Is aortic valve disease genetic? Uh, it's not genetic in the sense that you the a gene is passed down directly from one of your parents, and because they have it, you have it. But there is. Um, there is a significant sort of familial tendency toward it. So if it is in your family, um, there's a, there is a uh, greater chance that, you'll, that you could have the same problem. Uh, the good news, you know, is this is a disease that's fairly easily detected. It's a disease of, of older folks in general. Um, so later in life, if you're going to the doctor and they hear a murmur, um, you should have an echocardiogram, and then it can be... Uh, detected, followed, and treated. So that's the good news. Yeah. I, the, there's a question. How do you know it's time to have an aortic valve replaced? What are the symptoms? 
Sure. So the, that decision is guided by uh, symptoms, as the uh, questioner is asking, and by and by physical findings. So uh, symptoms are commonly fatigue, shortness of breath, uh, could be lightheadedness. Uh, sometimes the people describe you know needing frequent naps. Unfortunately, those are really vague and 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 common in folks as they age. But what I typically hear from patients is that this is. They're having these symptoms, and this is different. You know, this is a change for them. Um, for example, you know, I'll hear from uh, the patient's spouse. Well, you know, I mean, last year he was great, and now this year he's like, take, has breakfast, takes a nap. You know, has lunch, takes a nap. Or, or I used to be able to keep up with my wife when we hike, and now I can't even come close to it. It was only a year ago. So some kind of a change in a relatively short period of time is a, is a signal. Um, again, I mentioned if you're going to the doctor, uh, if you have a murmur, that, that's one way to detect it. And then the other um, question about timing is based on the echocardiogram. So there are specific measurements that are taken. We can measure how big the valve, remember we were talking about, you want to have a big opening? Well, this causes, aortic stenosis causes the valve to, to get narrow. We can measure that, we measure it by, um, by flow velocity and by area and some things like that. So, so a combination of symptoms, and, and measurements. And every once in a while, we get somebody who is, uh, says they have no symptoms whatsoever, but we can look at the picture and see that it's, it's really bad. And those pa patients, even in the absence of symptoms, should be treated. Uh, what conditions would disqualify a patient from having a TAVER procedure? Oh, um, Active infection, um, any um, if so, some people who are who, who don't get treated might be those who are you know dying from another condition. So if you have lung cancer or some advanced malignancy, where the life expectancy based on your your cancer is you know less than a year, it, it might not be worth the risk of doing it. There are other, but again, these are highly, um, uh, highly specific questions, and, and it doesn't mean all patients with cancer shouldn't have TAVR because there are many people who, who have two conditions, right? They've got a tumor or cancer, and they've got aortic stenosis, and just to get through their treatment, they need to get their valve fixed. So we see people like that too. So cancer is not an exclusion uh, unless it's you know very end stage and people are in their final months. Active infection, that's that's. Uh, can't do that, the valve gets infected then, and that just becomes a, a bigger problem. Right, kind of similar. Is a person with a stroke history a good candidate for this valve replacement? They can be, they certainly can be. Stroke does not necessarily exclude uh, people. Um, certainly many people with stroke have been treated with TAVR. The, um, one of the key things about, about recovery is uh, we want patients to get up and move. So mobility issues can increase your risk a little bit. Uh, but again, they're not exclusionary. We've done people in wheelchairs and amputees and people who don't move quite as well. Um, but mobility is important. If you're bedridden, um, probably not a good idea either. Right. Is the study shared, uh, in the study that you shared, could the difference seen in SVD be because the TAVR is the second valve repair? Mm. So I, I think I know what the person is asking. Yeah, it, in the study shared, could the difference seen in the SVD be because the TAVR is the second valve repair? Right, so all of these patients that were in the study had no previous aortic valve um, instrumentation or replacement. So they're all, all native, native disease. Uh, this is specific to a patient. We have, you know, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, my recent PET CT scan identified that I have an ascending aortic aneurysm, 4.7 centimeter. How serious is that? Uh, it's serious enough that you should, um, you should have an appointment with a doctor to talk about when is the proper time to fix that. But that's a, that's a real aneurysm, should not be ignored, and that patient should have an appointment to discuss timing and treatment. 
So um, you you have done over 2,000, Tabor? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to, guess wanted to confirm that you've done, you know, over 2,000 yes. procedures. The program I started in Wisconsin, uh, when I left, we were doing about 400 cases a year. Currently, they're still very busy now doing about 500 cases a year. So we're in a huge volume clinic specifically identified, you know, for this type of procedure in a huge referral area. So we were, we were blessed to get a, a, a large experience in a short period of time. Uh, are there more devices in development so that at the 10-year replacement time there may be better solutions? Right. Well, so I think that um, this is it's a good place to, you know, I, I think we're getting close to the end. So I'm glad this question came up. We are... We tell patients that these, the surgically implanted valves that we've been using for a long time have, are generally good from t for 10 to 15 years. Now we're seeing data that this that the specific superannular valve is outperforming these, uh, these surgical implants in, in terms of durability, which I think will lead to the fact that these are 15-year valves, solid 15 years. And the reality is that most people who are, for most people who get a transcatheter valve or surgical valve, 15 years will cover most people's lifetime, uh, achieving that goal of, hey doc, you know, I, I, just, want, I just want it once. Uh, and, and so I think we're getting, we're getting very close to that for a lot of people. And last question, is there any way to extend the life of these valves? Um, uh, well, and, and then the second part of that was, how do you know when it's time to replace them? But is there a, how can you make your valve last longer? Is there a well, way? There's, there are literally um, millions and millions of dollars in that space of research and development. Some people are looking at coating the leaflets, those uh, with special chemicals. Historically, um, those haven't really proven to be as effective. But the, the changes in design Changes in leaflet treatment, changes in material are all, they gradually get better, you know, every few years. But I think this is a big breakthrough uh, now that we're seeing really the ho highest performing valves that are available to humans for the aortic position. It's a real step forward over where we've been for the last 20 years and certainly over the last 50. So, um, and when do they wear out? They, eventually everything wears out. And if you're really good, you know, if everything goes well for you, it would be nice to outlive your valve. And that can be detected. Um, uh, with echocardiogram, and then there are re-replacement uh, techniques.